Inauguration 96, the events and activities surrounding the swearing-in of Daniel Kirkwood Fordyce, Jr. as governor of the state of Mississippi. This is a production of the Mississippi Educational Network, Mississippi State University, the University of Mississippi, Jackson State University, and the University of Southern Mississippi. To begin our coverage, here are John Johnson and Liz Blankenship. Well, welcome to ETV's live coverage of the inauguration of Kirk Fordyce. I'm John Johnson. And I'm Liz Blankenship. Thank you for joining us for what is certain to be the beginning of another four years of exciting politics in Mississippi. Oh, that's right, Liz. Uh, it's a very pleasant day here in Jackson. We have mostly sunny skies, and the temperature is going to be expected to be somewhere around the 50s. Uh, right now, we are watching the invited guests and dignitaries as they settle in to watch this historical inauguration. The Special Forces Color Guard will begin the ceremony by carrying the flags to the podium. Members of the Highway Patrol and the Joint Services make up the Color Guard, which we should see process in shortly. Liz, you know, uh, this year's inauguration is especially significant since it is the first time this century that a Mississippi governor has been elected to serve two consecutive four-year terms. Now, Governor Fordyce is only the second governor to have ever been uh, served back-to-back -to -back terms. Now, Governor Robert Lowry was the first back in 18. 86. Wow, quite a <laughs> historical accomplishment, John. Of course, Governor Fordyce won this honor by defeating Secretary of State Dick Maupas in the November 7th general election, 56% to 44%. He has a distinction of being the first Republican governor in over 117 years. Now, before he took office in 1992, Governor Fordyce had lived in Vicksburg for more than 30 years. Now, after four years here in Jackson, it is... Uh, he seems pretty content to make this his home for a little while longer. At least we won't see another moving van in front of the governor's mansion for some time. Yeah, well, now, <laughs> speaking of the governor's mansion, the residence occupied by the four dices has the distinction of being the second oldest occupied governor's residence in the country. It has quite a history, John. Uh, did you know it was one, only one of a handful of buildings mm. to survive the Civil War and the burning of Jackson? They used it as a hospital. Well, it wasn't until 1908 that full restoration began on the mansion. It was actually condemned in 1971, but Governor and Mrs. Waller led a $2.7 million restoration project, and that was finished in 1975. Now the mansion is a national historic landmark and a beautiful residence with lovely hardwood floors and a Victorian-style staircase. Well, the inauguration is once again being held on the south steps of the new capital in Jackson. Uh, since it was dedicated in 1903, uh, the, we will now go to the MC that is there right now. Today is historic. For the first time in this century, the electorate has chosen a man to succeed himself in the highest elected office in our state. Inauguration Day traditionally marks the celebration of new responsibilities and new opportunities. Too often we expect the rights and rewards of living in a free society, but are not willing to accept the hard work, the dedication and sacrifice which must be the foundation of that society. In the Book of Virtues, William Bennett emphasizes self-discipline, compassion, responsibility, friendship, work, courage, perseverance, honesty, loyalty, and faith. For any people, these traits are not optional. For history tells us that when such values are abandoned, civilization crumbles and chaos reigns. It is therefore imperative that we teach these values to our children. Proverbs 22 tells us, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. If we do not accept this task, we will be responsible for the demise of a unique society. After too many years of self-indulgence, it is now time for us to reflect upon the importance of personal involvement, service to our community, and individual work for the good of all. It is time to set aside personal agendas and to work toward renewing the Jeffersonian concept of a citizen democracy. Consider the words of Representative Robert Clark of Ebenezer. This is how we have brought Mississippi as far as we have. All these people working together. Working together will continue to make a better Mississippi, and that's without regard to race, 
creed, or political party. Some truths are self-evident. The next four years are a challenging time for all of us. Not only are we looking toward a new century, but we are looking toward a new millennium. Let us join Governor Fordyce and his lovely First Lady as they meet the challenges of a new term. Let us roll up our sleeves and answer yes when we are asked to serve. Let us put virtue to work in our lives. Let us become the role models that our children so desperately need. Let us show them the agents of our future, that one person can make a difference and that virtue has inherently great rewards. Tis a small thing that, just properly raising our children. And yet all that depends upon it is the preservation of this state and this nation, the last best hope of freedom. Thank you very much, and again, welcome. I now present to you the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Honorable Tim Ford. Good job. Uh, let me call the Joint Assembly together. I'm going to ask you to remain standing for the invocation by Dr. Sam Morris, who is the pastor of the Galloway United Methodist Church here in Jackson, and remain standing for the national anthem to be performed by the Mississippi Opera. Dr. Morris. Let us pray. Gracious God, we recognize today that your wisdom and your grace are needed. As you have ordained the governments of the earth, so you have ordained this one. And we pray that by your spirit and by your wisdom, we may expect to enter this new millennium as a people of hope and courage, facing the future, making the best of the present, and excited about life as you have given it to us. We acknowledge that your presence is needed in all our lives and by all our people, and we express our gratitude to you for offering yourself to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Now you may be seated. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Mississippi who will preside over this Joint Assembly, the Honorable Ronnie Musgrove. There we see Lieutenant Governor Ronnie Musgrove. Musgrove was elected Lieutenant Governor in November defeating Eddie Briggs by a comfortable margin. He'd served as a member of the Senate representing District 10 since 1987. Today to inaugurate our state's 38th governor, Daniel 
Kirkwood, Fort Ives. Lieutenant Governor was sworn in, in on only a few days ago himself in a special session on Thursday. As we said earlier, um, Eddie Briggs by a comfortable margin. He's been very active in a number of committees in the Senate, most notably the Senate Education Committee, the Judiciary Committee, and the local private and public utilities committee. I just told the governor that when he gets too liberal, we're going to remind him that he's supposed to be a conservative. Well, Lieutenant Governor Musgrove is a native of Batesville, Mississippi, and a graduate of the University of Mississippi with an undergraduate degree in business administration and a law degree from the School of Law. As we said, he's been very active. Musgrove has been very popular also among his colleagues in the Senate. It'll be interesting to see if the de de Democratic Lieutenant Governor will be as popular with a very strong Republican Governor. Well, the, as we said earlier, Governor Fordyce is only the second man in Mississippi history to succeed himself in the office of governor and the only Republican elected since Reconstruction. Now, after such an accomplishment, uh, you might think the governor would have some interesting insights on what makes a man great, and you'd be right. Daniel Kirkwood Fordyce, Jr. And repeat after me. Four years ago, a contractor from Vicksburg with almost zero name recognition won the governorship of the state of Mississippi. Fordyce was the first Republican to be elected to the state's highest office in more than a century. Four years later, Fordyce made history again by becoming the first governor to win back-to-back -back elections since Reconstruction. While Fordyce is certainly a household name across the state, his background is less well known. Kirk Fordyce was born in Memphis on February 10, 1934, in the height of the Depression. His father worked for the Army Corps of Engineers. He has one older sister. According to Fordyce, the most valuable lesson learned as a youth was hard work. His father made sure of that. He saw that I worked uh, about as hard as a human being can work every summer, and he knew that that would, at, at manual labor jobs in construction, he knew that that would teach me the value of an education. He was right. Uh, if you... Fordyce attended East High School in Memphis, graduating in 1952. An honor student, Fordyce played as a guard and tackle on the football team. In his senior year, fellow students voted Fordyce as most intelligent. His favorite subjects were math and science, especially physics. A self-described rowdy kid, Fordyce got his first taste of politics as a senior in high school. There existed a two-party system at East High, the Reds and the Grays. The teaching faculty had approved candidates for both parties for school president. Fordyce was not one of them. We weren't on either one of those parties, so a bunch of us rebels got together and invented the Rebel Party, a third independent party. <laughs> and I got, I got elected <laughs> probably, probably more than anything else uh, just to show the uh, teachers that they couldn't control everything in our lives. <laughs> East High was also where Fordyce met his wife, Pat. They continued to date while Fordyce attended engineering school at Purdue. They eventually married after Kirk's junior year in college. At Purdue, Fordyce earned his engineering degree with high honors. After college, Fordyce had an ROTC military obligation and served two years of active duty. He continued on in the reserves for another 18 years, eventually retiring as a full colonel. After working a short stint with what is now the Exxon Corporation, Fordyce moved to Vicksburg, Mississippi in 1962 to join his father in business. He spent the next 25 years doing what he always knew he would, helping run, manage, and grow the family construction company, a profession he says he was well suited for. Always got a great deal of satisfaction out of uh, uh, the construction life. It's a, I guess it's a simple satisfaction that a lot of people don't get, maybe they don't need, but when you can stand back and say, I built that or drive all around town and see the buildings that you built, see the, the good works, that's physical good works that you've done, it's a, it's a great satisfaction. Although one of the original builders of the Republican Party in Mississippi, Fordyce was an unknown political figure until he started his run for the governorship in 1991. A father of four and a grandfather of eight, Fordyce continues to find strength through his father, who passed away in 1977. 
but he was a he was a very admirable person, and uh, I looked up to him greatly, and uh, I wanted to do everything that I could to please him. I guess like most sons uh, do. Fordyce is passionate about his hobbies, which include a love for the outdoors, horses, and hunting. He's also an accomplished private pilot. Unfortunately, life as governor doesn't leave much time for these outside interests. Fordyce says his recreation pursuits will once again take a backseat to the business at hand of running state government. Well, John, this ceremony is really only one of a number of events that have taken place in celebration of the inauguration of Kirk Fordyce. In fact, the first of the celebrations took place Sunday with a reception honoring First Lady Pat Fordyce. Sunday morning was bright and very cold in Jackson. But inside the Capitol Rotunda, warmth and cheer were in abundance as the Mississippi Federation of Republican Women prepared to honor Mississippi's First Lady, Patricia Owens Fordyce, with a reception and tea. Mrs. Fordyce and a distinguished reception party greeted a steady line of well-wishers from 2 p.m. until 4. Mrs. Melanie Musgrove, among the first to be greeted by the First Lady, expressed the feelings of many on this happy occasion. Well, it's an honor. First of all, to be here to uh, represent and to see Mrs. Fordyce and uh, represent the state. She is a gracious lady in all sense of the words. And uh, we were afraid the weather was going to stop us from coming today, but we're just very fortunate. And we're just delighted that we're here and can share in the festivities with Mr. and Ms. Fordyce this week. And we just look forward to the next four years. These sentiments were echoed often throughout the reception. A great day, the Republican women holding this for the most gracious First Lady I think maybe the state's ever had. A fantastic day. Uh, she's beaming. Uh, uh, it's just tremendous. I think that, that Mississippi has much to be proud of in the First Lady. She's extremely gracious and well-loved by all the citizens. I think she, she makes all Mississippians proud. As the reception closed, the First Lady expressed her gratitude. It has been a real celebration. Four years ago, the Republican women did this, and we all celebrated the fact that a Republican had won the governorship. And I am so grateful that they chose to do this again after four years, and it's just been a lovely day. People have come from all over the state, and I'm, I'm really humbled by it. Well, this has been quite a busy week and quite a busy weekend, and it is continuing, culminating today. Let's go back to the state capitol where we're getting ready to hear from the governor and the governor's wife. An increase of $5 million in our tourism budget, the creation of thousands of new jobs, and a concentrated effort to recruit new businesses and industries to expand existing businesses. But the governor made perhaps his wisest decision in 1955 when he married the former Patricia Owens of Jackson. They have four grown children and eight grandchildren. And I assure you that on any given day, Governor Fordyce is more than willing to discuss them with you as opposed to politics. Daniel Kirkwood Fordyce, Jr. The name will be remembered in Mississippi history for generations to come as the only governor to be elected to two consecutive four-year terms during the 20th century. It is my pleasure to present to you the governor of the state of Mississippi, the Honorable Kirk Fordyce. Yes, sir. The mother of four, the grandmother of eight, and wife of Governor Fordyce. First Lady Pat Fordyce has surely earned for herself a place in history as one of Mississippi's most energetic, enthusiastic, warm, and gracious First Ladies. As First Lady, Ms. Fordyce has worked to implement literacy programs, promote immunization of Mississippi's children, and recruit volunteers to raise funds with the hope of improving the quality of life for our handicapped and seriously ill children and their families. In a coordinated effort with the Department of Public Safety, Mrs. Fordyce contributed to the publication of the Violence Prevention Resource Guide. She truly exemplifies what we term as hospitality and Southern charm. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present to you the First Lady, 
of the state of Mississippi, Ms. Patricia Owens Fordyce. Mrs. Fordyce will now share with us a scripture which she has chosen for this occasion. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Musgrove. I'll read to you from Psalms, the 67th chapter. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving help among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Amen and amen. Thank you. 
Mississippi Code Section 7-1-1 states that the governor shall be inaugurated on at 12 noon on the first Tuesday following the ascertaining of who is elected governor or as soon thereafter as practicable. As the noon hour approaches on this selected day, in keeping with this statutory mandate, I call on Chief Justice of the Mississippi Supreme Court, the Honorable Dan Lee, to administer the governor's oath. Chief Justice Lee, Governor, Ms. Fordyce, if you would come forward. But he wanted to win the board to pick up too, I guess. It's a real pleasure. If you'd raise your right hand, please, and repeat after me. I, Daniel Kirkwood Fordyce, Jr. I, Daniel Kirkwood Fordyce, Jr. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully support the Constitution of the United States. That I will faithfully support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Mississippi. And the Constitution of the State of Mississippi. And obey the laws thereof. And obey the laws thereof. That I am not disqualified from holding the office of governor. That I am not disqualified from holding the office of governor. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office. Which I'm about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you so much. Thank you. 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 the 19 pin salute honoring Governor Kirk Fordyce and his first lady Pat Fordyce. It is a tradition among the military to do this kind of honor, signifying the importance of his role as head of state of the state of Mississippi. Now, this, is, this is, Liz, a very, very important day, and as you can see, the governor is dressed in a top coat. Uh, the governor's wife, the first lady, uh, has been. It is a brisk day, but a beautiful day in downtown Jackson. No clouds in the sky at all. And that's what they had promised. He was bound and determined that they would have this outside, under the skies, and under the trees near the Capitol. All right. Now, Governor Fordyce. I thought there was 17. <laughs> One more. That's 19. That's 19. That's 19. Oh, well, I think we go right after this. Just say it's all yours now. I think it says 19 gun sleep in the dress. So that's it. Governor, it's all yours. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you so much. What a beautiful, glorious day this is. Warmer than 1992, isn't it? I stood on these steps of this capital four years ago, humbled by the challenge before us and heartened by your support and thankful for this opportunity for service given by God to a 57-year-old contractor from Vicksburg. I stand here today no less humble, even more heartened, and supremely thankful. 
I feel the weight of this momentous occasion, and I am keenly aware that after the first four years of public service, a governor is judged by the voters, but in the last four years, he is judged by history. The challenge in 1992 was to move this ship of state together forward. The challenge now is to prepare for the years beyond 2000. I say today that with the new millennium will come a new Mississippi. We have, we have moved Mississippi forward. Together we have accomplished much. Free enterprise and entrepreneurship are alive and well in the state of Mississippi. Our people are more prosperous. Our welfare recipients are enjoying their first taste of personal initiative and hope in decades. The future for Mississippi's children beckons brighter. Criminals are more fearful for their punishment is administered more swiftly and with more certainty. Together, we have introduced into the great marketplace of ideas efficiency and accountability in state government, effectiveness and in innovation in education, and fiscal responsibility with the hard-earned tax dollars of Mississippi citizens. Four years ago, these may have been revolutionary ideas, but now they are the driving force behind the citizens' rebellion to restore government of the people, by the people, and for the people. This has not been an administration, it has been a crusade. The great political movement of which we are a part is, in a sense, a rediscovery of what originally made this country great. As we anticipate the 21st century, what was a radical idea in the latter part of the 18th century is unfortunately still an extreme concept to many. As Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator, by their creator, with certain unalienable rights, and among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then he went on to write that the only powers government can morally exercise are those given with the consent of the governed. Mississippi has a unique opportunity to succeed in this next millennium, not only because of the success that our state has enjoyed in the last four years, but also because of our shared experiences of the entire 20th century. Experience is a great teacher. Mississippi, like no other state, has experienced and faced the problems and challenges of the last 100 years. It has been said that character is forged in the crucible of adversity. Our metal has been forged in these same fires. We have emerged shining and tempered with the strength that can be obtained only through great trials. On behalf of the state of Mississippi, and with the blessing of our citizens, both black and white, yellow, red, and brown, let me say to our sister states and to the rest of the world, Mississippi doesn't do race anymore. The 60s are over. This is 1996, and we want to be judged by our deeds here and now, and not by what happened then and there. We will acknowledge our history, but we will not let it determine our future. The only race that we're concerned with is the race for more jobs, for better schools, for safer neighborhoods, and the race for lower taxes. <laughs> Despite the adversities of 20th century life, our people have not abandoned that which made them strong. We still have faith in God. We have not abandoned our hometowns and farms. And we still believe that those values which are best are those we learn from our families. Mississippians, like no other people, are ready for the challenges of the future. We here in Mississippi have seen others stand before us at this podium and pop promise greatness. 
and all too many times we've been disappointed. That is why as we gather here today, I tell you that the answer lies, lies not with me, but with you. I say let you keep more of your tax dollars. Let you have the opportunity for a job. Let you control your child's school and let you control your own destinies. <laughs> Ronald Reagan, my hero, may have best summed up this self-reliant view of government 20 years ago in 1976 when he said, and I quote, I'm sure everyone feels sorry for the individual who has fallen by the wayside or who can't keep up in our competitive society. But my compassion goes beyond that to those millions of unsung men and women who get up every morning, send the kids to school, go to work, try to keep up the payments on the house, pay exorbitant taxes to make possible compassion for the less fortunate, and as a result have to sacrifice many of their own desires dreams and hopes. Government owes them something better than always finding a new way to make them share the fruit of their toils with others." End of quotation. <laughs> there are many critics among us whose only vision for the new millennium is the one formed by their fears. Some wring their hands and say, how will we survive if there is less federal money to spend? Some tremble and ask, what will we do without Uncle Sam to regulate us? To the prophets of doom and the naysayers and the critics, I say, steady your nerves and check your cynicism at the door. I believe it to be no coincidence that once, what was once the poorest state in the Union also is the one burdened with the most federal intervention. For too long, a distant capital has used our state as a social engineering product project it is time for that failed project to end. <laughs> Federal devolution will create tremendous opportunities for us. We can build our own welfare system, one that is more like a safety net and less like a hammock. We can maintain our clean air and our clean water without mountains of paper and regulations too complex to be understood by even the most specialized of lawyers. We can provide real job training, not make work in poorly disguised government employment programs. And we can do all this without building up billions and trillions of dollars of debt. If we do these things, we will see a new Mississippi in the new millennium. After I was elected four years ago, many well-intentioned people told me that the best way to be successful in this job was to get along. Four years later, I'm amazed at how this advice is still given to me. I suppose it is only human nature to want to be liked. However, that's not the job description for the job you have given me. It is not a job for the faint-hearted, and I need you to be strong with me. I believe that I need to be tough as governor so that our children and our grandchildren won't have it so tough when they grow up in Mississippi. You may not always agree with me, but you must admit that you never have to doubt where I stand on an issue. I will always shoot straight with you, and I promise that I will never change in that regard. I live by four simple questions that I ask myself before any decision that I make as governor. Is it pleasing in the eyes of the Lord? Is it good for the people of Mississippi? How much will it cost? And how are we going to pay for it? It's no secret that, like many of you, I love the outdoors. I have a keen appreciation for the balance that exists in nature and the roles of each of God's creatures. A lion in the bush can be a very docile creature. But once his attention is aroused and a switch flips in his head, he is hard to dissuade. He isn't always successful the first time, but he can be counted on to persist. A lion cannot be criticized for having a strong personality. He does what he knows best, and there is a role for him on this earth created by God. My place is not in the middle of the road. 
I cannot go along just for the sake of getting along. On occasion, I may have to swallow my pride, but I cannot swallow my principles. As a contractor, I've spent my entire life building things of concrete and steel, wood and stone. But my greatest project in life has been this wonderful state. It is made of heart, soul, faith, and hope, the greatest building materials known to man. You have extended my contract to work for you on this glorious project, and I pledge to you that I will roll up my sleeves one more time and give it all of the blood, sweat, and tears that God has ever given one man. Four years from now, Lord willing, on January the 11th of the year 2000, yes, in the new millennium, we will meet here one last time. On that day, I will be sitting in one of the chairs right behind me now as a spectator just like you. I hope for many things on that day, but most of all, I hope and pray that as I look into the crowd, I will be able to tell by the smiles on your faces that we were successful in our mission, that we moved this great state together forward and that the new millennium has truly brought a new Mississippi. God bless each and every one of you. God bless Mississippi and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sheldon Gooch will now sing America the Beautiful. Oh, on the 
The benediction will be given by Dr. Sam Morris, after which we will have the formal adjournment of the Joint Assembly. Let us first bless God for what God has done. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who giveth us life, who gives us the beauty of this earth in which we live, and who offers us the opportunity to live in such a land as this. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who gives us the opportunity for good work, to be just as you are just, who gives us the opportunity to participate with you in the work of your hands. And so with the knowledge of the blessing which you are, take us from this place to be your servants. And may your blessing continue to be seen upon the people who call upon your name and who live by your word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. A gorgeous ceremony with all of the pomp and circumstance befitting an occasion like this one. Uh, of course, we see the color guard, the many dignitaries from across the United States and even farther from there outside and around the world. Um, also, an extremely wonderful anthem, America, sung by Sidney Gooch. Yes. It was wonderful. Always, always. And he has a wonderful voice. Yes, he does. Well, you, the, the speech, of course, was about 10 minutes long. And, um, you know, of course, the governor did all of the things that he said he was going to say, talked about the fact that he was no less humble than he was. He was humble four years ago. He's no less humble uh, today. Well, Governor and Mrs. Fordyce uh, uh, spent the morning, I guess, and uh, they did a lot of, a lot of things today. But uh, I guess the uh, hundreds of volunteers and many other people worked hard, and hard work went into the preparation for this inauguration. JSU's Channel 23 reporter Laura Powell shares with us the sights, the sounds, and the smells of inaugural bliss. The rumble of a forklift. The sizzle of food grilling. The slicing and chopping of veggies along with weeks of preparation of 600 volunteers. That's the recipe for spectacular inaugural festivities. Take the gala event at the Harvey Hotel, for instance. Hopefully we've got a lot of delectable things. We've got pasta stations, carving stations. We've got a big Viennese table with a lot of pastries. Um, hot hors d'oeuvres, some cold hors d'oeuvres, cheeses, fruits, you name it. It was just as busy at the Mississippi Trademark Center, where brilliant chandeliers shared center stage with workers moving in plants, decorating trees, and stringing balloons. A picture-perfect scene to be completed tonight, with 10,000 guests dancing to the music of several types of bands. I like being able to work on this scale. I mean, this is a pretty large event and working with that many people in different establishments all coming together and all to make an event, it, it really does elicit a great deal of excitement from everybody that's involved. And that all going together, the energy that goes into all that really does make for a pleasant experience as well as hopefully a, a big, exciting um, event. Speaking of exciting events, the Mississippi Humanities Council sponsored their second annual inaugural seminar. The theme highlighted children and their civic responsibilities for the new millennium. Children are our future. We need to make sure that they have the kind of future that will provide them the inspiration and the aspirations and the opportunities to do all the things that they wish to do and all the things that they can do and all the things that they should do in order to make this a much better society for all of us. The overall atmosphere of all the preparations and events was filled with excitement. Excitement that Governor Fordyce hopes will continue. Governor and Ms. Fordyce spent the morning with family, friends, and supporters at a prayer service at Galloway Memorial United Methodist Church in Jackson. The governor and his wife once again processed into the church to the sounds of bagpipes playing Amazing Grace. Ministers from various denominations offered prayers and readings throughout the interdenominational service. Choir members from various congregations made up the interfaith choir, which offered up musical selections, including some of the governor's favorites. It was a quiet time for the Fordyces to offer thanks and ask blessings for successful four years ahead.
I, it is probably very proper that uh, as they had that prayer service this morning, Liz, that as the governor had just been uh, sworn into office, that at 12 noon the church bells downtown were ringing just as he was just just as he started doing that. Several churches in and around the state capitol there, First Baptist and Galloway Methodist. And he is a United Methodist. I guess that is one, one of the church. things that happened there. He's Crawford Street United Methodist Church in Vicksburg. In Vicksburg. I was looking at some of the video from the uh, gala or for the ball this evening. You might note that the chandeliers hanging at the trademark are made out of Visqueen. Mm. And several of the columns there um, were donated by different construction companies around the state. They are actually drain pipes. So uh, quite a lot of action going on down at the trademark to make it look beautiful and shimmering for their night there. Now it is no doubt a very big day. Of course mm -hmm. the parade is downtown that starts at the fairgrounds and of course we'll go through the downtown area by the governor's mansion. Starts about uh, 1.30 I believe. It's so going to be packed down it there. It will be packed down, down in downtown Jackson. Um, so if you're not there already, I, <laughs> get down you're there probably quickly. going to be very tough to get down there at this point. Quite an interesting speech, don't you think? Uh, I did. He, um, it was straight out of Republican mantra, family values, very conservative thinking. He's, a, he's an accomplished public speaker. He makes no bones about saying exactly what he mm -hmm. thinks and saying it. One of the things that he did say is that he, he, he will always shoot straight. You don't have to That's doubt right. what I say, he says, <laughs> as, as, as governor, and there's no doubt that uh, he's done that. All right. Uh, well, there are a lot of people waiting down at the Capitol, certainly a lot of dignitaries, and I believe we have somebody there waiting for us to uh, fill us in. Uh, Teresa, P Teresa Pace is down there. <laughs> Teresa, hello. Teresa Hi, John. Hi, John and Liz. Um, there are lots of people hanging around here. One of the persons, or one of the, the public officials that's hanging around today is um, Speaker of the House, Tim Ford. Thank you for joining yes, us. Governor Ford Heiss has talked about, about a new millennium, a new Mississippi. What do you... We started off, the governor, lieutenant governor, myself, uh, as well as our respective bodies, on a very good note, very positive note. We feel like it's going to carry us into the uh, next four years, into the new millennium, uh, with a very positive approach to government. How do, what impact do you think we have on the 96th legislative session? We feel like it's uh, going to be very, uh, a very good year. We hope the whole four years are very good. Uh, this year, we don't have near as much uh, uh, money, revenues uh, coming in as we have the last three years. However, every now and then, you need to, to, to have a leveling off period to see where you are. Next year, we hope it's going to be better. Uh, it, let me back up and say we haven't, we, our revenues are in very good shape. Uh, we just don't have the growth that we've experienced the last three years. Well, thank you. John and Liz, back to you. All right. Um, thank, thank you, you very much, Teresa. Good job down there. Yeah. Tim Ford, of course, is from Tupelo, Speaker of the House. He talked about the new millennium, and you probably may hear, you certainly can't do any speculation, it's four years from now, and you never know what would happen, but he probably will be one of those people that will be speculated uh, as they talk about who's going to be the next governor, or who will t run for governor. Uh, Tim Ford also, you may note that, that he's back as, again as Speaker. There is a very strong Democratic leadership there at the legislature, so it would be very interesting to see the dynamics between a strong Republican governor and a very Democratic legislature. As you, as you well know, Lieutenant Governor uh, Musgrove is, it was very popular, mm -hmm. as, as you said earlier today. Uh, he is very popular, of course, with his people in the legislature, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this deals with, uh, with the governor. Of course, all of those people, whether they're Democrat or Republican, will be down at the trademark tonight. Uh, there's going to be a live band, lots of people, very dressed up in black tie. Uh, the biggest party of a number of parties that have been going on throughout Jackson. Um, I know they had at least one party at the downtown at the Harvey last night, another mm -hmm. one at the Emporium, all private donations coming in to raise money for the ceremony that you just saw here well, on the, the TV. And the governor can throw a, a party in a very classy <laughs> one. There's absolutely no question about that. He has talked about his lifestyle in terms of making sure that things are correct and right, and he has done that. I remember when he won four years ago, they were down at a, a hotel in Vicksburg, very small affair. Um, everybody had to scramble to go from Jackson over to where the governor had won. So it was uh, quite a different situation from what we see now. Okay. Well, well this is going to do it. Is this end of our this, live coverage? This is going to conclude our live coverage, of course. Right. Uh, in the inauguration of Governor Kirk Fordyce, we invite you to join us this evening at 7 for a one-hour recap of all the events, including highlights from the parade this afternoon at 1.30.
We thank you for joining us for this historic event. And as always, we invite you to join us each Friday evening for Statewide Live. And beginning tomorrow night, Liz will be hosting a new season of Quorum. So we hope you'll keep it tuned on ETV for the best in public affairs programming. Until then, good afternoon. Good afternoon.